Hi, everyone. Welcome to our afternoon session of SNP Association testing. Um, can we have a quick show of hands in the Zoom who was here, who was not here in the morning? If you were not in here in the morning, can you please raise your hand in the Zoom? I see no hands raised. So thanks for everyone for coming back. Um, we have one person in person who's um, who's new. So quick introduction. My name is Emily. I'm a master's student who just graduated medical genetics, um, did everything that we're talking about almost in this workshop for my thesis, except for fine mapping. Um, I am Haley. I am also a master's student in medical genetics, and I have um, four years of computational experience. Um, haven't done any of this for my thesis, but have experience working with this. So, so yeah. Um, so like this morning, um, we're going to try and keep questions on the Zoom chat and our TAs will field them and let us know in person if we should answer them. Um, and similar to this morning, it's going to be, oh, why did this move? It's going to be mostly lecture based with a bit more going through RMDs and going through the code a little bit more because these are the applications of what we discussed this morning. Um, with regards to the individual level genetic SNP data, as well as um, GWAS summary statistics, which are basically um, summarizing SNPs that may or may not be associated with a trait um, from a separate population. So without further ado, um, we'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam um, people. And again, the copyright information you can see here, um, yeah, you have to give credit, but you can share it essentially. Um, and then for links, again, we have our GitHub link, um, Slack feed for any like retrospective links that you want to look at, any questions, any discussion that you want Haley and myself to respond to after this workshop will still be in the Precision Health Bootcamp Slack. So, you know, message us there if you want. Um, and please, um, we'd appreciate any feedback um, after the survey, um, after this workshop is done through the survey link and our QR code. Um, this is the first year that we're doing the Precision Health Initiative. So any constructive feedback for next year's iterations of these workshops would be very productive. And please do see in the Slack channel, Phil actually put a lot of these surveys for the previous workshops there as well. Um, so if you wanted to retrospectively go back and do those for other workshops you attended, that would be much appreciated. Okay, so in the workshop session this morning, we learned about SNPQC file formats, and we may have generated some kind of GWAS summary statistics related to the trait you might be interested in. So three applications that we're going to be demonstrating with this data type in the afternoon is extracting this allele copy information to integrate into our friendly data types, fine mapping to identify causal SNPs among SNPs in linkage disequilibrium, and creating polygenic risk scores from GWAS summary statistics and applying it to a target population. So starting with extracting allele copy information, so say you want to integrate the number of copies of a high penetrant allele that's into um, of a high penetrant allele into your analysis with individual level data. So we can extract that info from the Plink Bed BIM FAM files using an R package called Genio, which was just um, accepted onto CRAM this year. So this allele copy information is very important because we do have um, those different um, frequencies of alleles in the population. And if we have common alleles, um, you would normally see common alleles associated with common disease and rare alleles um, associated with more Mendelian disease. Uh, anything else to add to that? Yeah, and we're focusing on um, rare diseases like the high penetrant alleles, just as an example for like people who might want to use this workflow. Um, I'm going to do full disclaimer. I was introduced to doing this in the context of an, a lab that was looking at Alzheimer's. And so they were interested in looking at the APOE E4 allele um, and seeing how prevalent that specific allele was in their population. And they asked me for like any thoughts on how to do this. 
Um, so that like the full disclaimer, that's the context of how I developed this. And APOE is a very like well-known, well-described allele for um, a number of traits. And this kind of analysis would be helpful for people who want to integrate allele information with demographic and other clinical information. So how does having this allele um, in conjunction, like when you adjust for having like age, socioeconomic status, cognitive status, um, other health information, this can be one more data point, essentially. You can do this for any number of alleles that you want, but for it to have a meaningful impact in your covariate analysis, like your multivariable model, it should have a high effect. Otherwise, what's the point of having it? Um, so hypothetically, you could do this for low, low effect alleles, but the utility of putting it in a model would be like, as if you didn't have it at all. So I'd recommend um, checking the um, report, like previous studies, how like how strongly an effect your allele has on a trait um, and how you can. So when you're choosing an allele, um, I found this resource really helpful, Snipedia. Um, so let's go there and explore it ourselves. Um, so this specific link is for this RSID. And I chose this RSID because when I did um, a a quick search on the GWAS catalog, which we talked about this morning session for migraine, this was one of the highest effect alleles on the trait. So on the GWAS catalog, you can literally sort columns by descending order of effect size, and you can just like see the top effect snips. Um, so that's one way to do it. Um, and for the purposes of this workshop, I just chose this one because it was present in the 1000 genomes population. And it has all these great um, details here about the reference that it was based on um, position and chromosome. And importantly, the um, minor allele frequency. Um, so you can see here that um, the supergenomes, so people who aren't familiar with this, these are different acronyms for different superpopulations. So CEU is like Central European Ancestry, correct? Um, HCB is Han Chinese from Beijing, JPT is for Japan, Japanese, YRI is Nigerian, like Yoruba, um, ASW, I'm not super sure, CHB is like a Colorado one, like you can see that these are different um, reference populations, and kind of building on what we learned this morning about how minor low frequencies are relative, you can see here, for example, the minor low frequency is quite a lot bigger, like a lot more people have the T allele in um, in this Nigerian population than the Japanese population. Um, and the homozygous TT allele just is not present in the Chinese population sample at all. So this is a helpful resource for you to kind of gauge how your study and in, studies in a population of interest um, reflects um, these trends previously reported. Um, and here you can see like a citation for what I was just described that it's been associated with migraine with aura, has a pretty high odds relative to the other ones. So that's that. Um, so I have, as we discussed this morning, all of our um, code is on the GitHub, but also under the Scratch and Project Server. I'm just on the Scratch space because that's where we do our work. Um, so we are going to look under the allele copies, right? So here I copied in our 1000 genomes QC, like post quality control steps, um, bed and fam files. And I have an RMD in here that I'll we'll go over shortly um, that has nice step by step explanations of code and different steps to basically analyze your data. So you can get um, individual level information about the number of copies someone has. So back to Snipedia, I want to know in my 1000 genomes data set, how many people have a CC genotype, how many people have CC, have CT, and how many have TT. So to do this, um, it's important to subset the QC file um, into just the snip of interest. Otherwise, reading, reading an entire Plank file of like thousands, if not millions of snips, will overload R and it will crash. <laughs> Like, I promise, like it's too much for a local computer, but I did try running the full QC plank file on Sockeye and Sockeye still couldn't, like Singularity still couldn't handle it. So um, I recommend um, extracting that information. 
Um, and as mentioned in this slide, it's important to first make sure that you have your slip, your SNP of interest in your BIM file. So if you use the grep command, it basically searches for a text entry in your file. Um, and you can just double check that your SNP is there and you'll get an output like this. Um, and then you can look at the SNP underscore subset PBS. Um, like here, and then you can edit. I use Nano, um, but you can edit with a, whatever like thing you want. And make sure that you change the B file to be your input um, individual level data. And then you can make a list. You so you have like either one one um, snip of interest or multiple, um, and you can write them here, um, separated by a comma, no space. Um, it's quite a straightforward command. Um, and if you have any questions about what any of these things mean, um, I highly recommend you just Google Plink Snips <laughs> and just like find the flag um, in there, right? A lot of coding is just kind of self-teaching through Google and Stack Overflow. Um, so once you have that out, I just named this a little copies one kg. Um, then you can import that into Genio. Um, so this slide just kind of shows a summary of what my script outputs. Um, so the three main outputs are a table with allele combinations for each individual ID. So the table shows on the left-hand side the ID number and the corresponding genotype um, for your given SNP on the second column. Um, you can see which combinations you have. Um, you, know, you know, for example, you, you might have as Phil was mentioning in the earlier session, you might have actually a triallelic um, SNP where there's a third allele that actually stays in your data set after quality control steps. So, so for example, maybe the A allele for some SNP would be in a frequency over 5%, um, but that didn't happen here. So we have two alleles, wonderful. And um, in my code, I also have a script that basically tabulates how many people have those different combinations of the alleles. Um, and you can see here that um, I filtered by how many copies of the T allele they have, because T is the minor allele. And if you're asking, how do you know what the minor allele is? Well, you just look at these tables and you can just visually see that C is the majority one. Um, so, yeah. Um, so if we go through the script itself, um, it's quite straightforward. Um, so I put a screenshot of this in the slide. This is the PBS script. Make sure you add your email here. Um, again, if you are new to command line um, HPC job submissions, I recommend that you look at Phil's intro workshops from last week to um, get oriented with submitting jobs and editing these things. Um, launching our studio, I do everything in the Tardiverse, just like as a rule of thumb, highly recommend it. And make sure that you have the Genio package downloaded. Um, again, there's this install packages um, work like workflow that Phil went through last week with regards to working on in our studio on Singularity. So make sure that you have Genio in installed before you open up our studio. Okay, and then the next thing is that you read in um, the little copies, read underscore plank is a function um, as a part of the Genio package. And you can subset the bed file, the BIM file, and the FAM file into these separate things. And um, here, again, this code is just for you to adapt as you see fit. <laughs> um, this is an important thing. So one through two, two, one, four, one. Um, this is the number of samples. So in my 1000 genomes, individual level data as this tutorials example, there's 2,141 people. So you need to change this number based on the number of people you have, um, as well as change this SNP to um, your idea of interest, if it's not this one. Um, besides that, everything's pretty straightforward. Um, and then, yeah, so it's a quite a short, easy script, um, but I hope that it's helpful for people. Sorry, where can I find that script? Yeah, so in person, we just had someone ask, where can I find that script? And you can find it at SNP Associations slash allele copies, and it's just allele copies .rmd. Um, And it also should be on the it's GitHub. Yes. It should be on the GitHub, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, 
that is it for my section for the first bit. We have three things. Second thing is fine mapping, which is Really? Yeah. So like Phil mentioned earlier, we have hundreds of different loci and within different loci in genome-wide association study results, we often have numerous SNPs that are related to each other or linked to each other through a mechanism known as linkage disequilibrium. So this is a measure of the linkage between SNPs. And one very useful tool for visualizing this linkage disequilibrium is Locus Zoom. This just allows you to upload a summary statistics file and see the SNPs in linkage disequilibrium with each other in um, yours across your genome. So within the migraine GWAS, we see multiple SNPs are known missense variants. So they are most likely to be functionally related to the phenotype of migraine, but we also see some really high linkage disequilibrium in these loci. Um, so I'll come back to imputation in a second, but if we just wanna to go to the next slide and look at the- Do you want me to go to locus now? Well, we're just gonna copy the okay. so link in the chat. Um, so these are the locus zoom plots for the two um, migraine loci that are in high linkage disequilibrium with other SNPs in this region. So you can see the lead SNP in purple in both of these um, plots. It's purple and named, but you can also see the red SNPs um, that are located nearby that are also in high equilibrium. And especially for this region on chromosome three, we have a lot of SNPs that may be close or not yet over um, genome-wide significance, but we still see that they are in high linkage disequilibrium with these SNPs. So where imputation can come into this, but complicates fine mapping, if you want to go back the slide. Um, so imputation is a way to fill in the gaps and fill in SNPs that we may have not analyzed in our data that we're looking at. So for a thousand genomes, we only have a certain number of SNPs um, in the data set. And for most genomic data, that's going to be the case. So there's the ability to impute this data and fill in variants that we don't have information for based on an external reference population. So I've used the Michigan imputation server for this before, um, and that's what I would recommend. Uh, where this can cause problems with fine mapping is introducing variants that may be relevant, but not they're not being measured directly. So we're getting potentially inflated um, effect sizes for these imputed SNPs that we're not actually measuring in our target population. And this also adds more SNPs to our analysis. So we're adding even more variants that may be in linkage disequilibrium with our lead SNP, therefore adding even more noise to this uh, genome-wide analysis. So what biomapping is hoping to do yeah. So when you're doing imputation, do you carry forward the ones you know were imputed, or do they all just look the same? Like at the end result, when you're looking at the SNPs and you're trying to do your fine mapping, do you retain, like, do you label those that were imputed and those that were real? Um, for fine mapping, I wouldn't recommend doing impute. I wouldn't so recommend doing it with data. computer data. Okay. So. so Phil's question was asking later, like, do you retrospectively look at if the SNPs were imputed versus the raw SNPs. And Haley said, don't, don't, don't get imputed data. Um, yeah. But you can with imputed data, there is a confidence interval when you impute data where it'll give you how confident it is that this is the right genotype. For like probably based on the distance. Based on a, the reference data and what data you're giving it. So you could, control based off that variable if you wanted to use imputed data, but it would, the process would take a much longer time as well because it's very computationally um, demanding. Mm -hmm. So I just have a really general question. You guys are keep mentioning migrates and um, um, I was wondering, is there a specific SNPs that are really related to migraines? Yeah. So the reason Sorry, I just I just did my twenty three and me, so then oh, I have my whole genetic data data set or whatever, and my dad has migraines. Mm, 
mm-hmm. like severe migraines. Mm-hmm. And then okay. now I'm, I'm really interested if I can use yeah. my 23 me data and see if I would be getting it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the question was, it was about why we're talking about migraines and what SNPs are yeah. related to migraines. So we are using the summary statistics that we're referencing as an example is from the most recent migraine GWAS. If you want to go to the next slide, it's actually this locus zoom plot is from this migraine GWAS. And what I can do is find this link for this analysis and, there's, and link it in the chat as well. And there's 123 risk loci. Yes, there's 123 risk loci. So narrowing those down to just two was selecting the SNPs that were most likely that are annotated to be affecting the protein coding process. So they're uh, um, more attractively use their missense variants. So they're most likely to actually have an effect on the phenotype. So that's how they picked these two SNPs out of the 123 loci. They picked these two loci to specifically um, look further into. Mm -hmm. And where fine mapping comes in is from these loci, we have so many SNPs still that we're not sure which one is actually the causal or the the variant that's actually related to the phenotype, Mm because it could be any of these next to this. We see so many red spots. At this point, I think it's important to actually articulate the theory, theory behind linkage disequilibrium. As I, I'm not sure if you have, I don't see a slide later on. Yeah, if you want to articulate it, you can. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of a complicated concept. So during genetic divisions, um, something called or like meiotic divisions, recombination happens where parents' genetic material gets swapped. So like on chromosome three at a specific point, there are these breakage points that happen throughout the genome. There's like th- millions of them. And the important thing is that they are not at regular intervals. So it's complex biology as to like where and why these recombination sites happen. But basically, researchers are looking into like where those recombination sites are. But SNPs, genetic variants that are in close physical proximity to each other, are more likely to be inherited together. Right? So when you have a breakpoint at this area, and then a break, I should actually start it. Um, <laughs> like, like here and here, and like this gets swapped with mom and dad's DNA here, such that this is translocated or like it's swapped. Um, this is recombination site one and two. All of these SNPs are inherited together. So in this in this slide, we see all these red dots. That's because they're all together. And something in this region is conferring risk to the trait. But we aren't sure which of those variants is actually the associated thing, which is why it's called a genome-wide association study, is because it's looking at variants that are more likely to be happening by chance in the trait than you would expect. Um, So the important thing is that linkage disequilibrium can also happen like, like really close by. And there's ways that people calculate LD that takes into account correlation numbers. So how correlated are two SNPs with each other, um, as well as like p-values as far as how confident that correlation is. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of weedy. But I hope that that theoretically it helps people online, but also um, in person with this concept of LD because it's it's kind of like why there's such a steep drop at like chromosome like position 88.3 on this like b panel and then 88.1 it kind of does a sharp drop so you can kind of assume that there's like two recombination points on either flank Mm -hmm. of those red dots and you can kind of see the recombination rates indicated in this locus zoom plot Mm -hmm. on the it's you can kind of it's under all of the snip dots but especially in this first there's this spike in the recombination rate um, right mm-hmm. near chromosome 15.2. So that's, yes, I think that's a good yeah. um, clarifier. This recombination is um, part of the sleepage to sleep equilibrium process. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay. Okay. 
So with fine mapping, we're hoping to clear all of this noise of this linkage disequilibrium and statistically pick the most relevant results from these GWAS results. And applications for this is any extension to GWAS results. So in this migraine paper we mentioned, they do fine mapping to um, kind of clarify from these busy loci what SNPs might actually be of interest. Um, and then this analysis can proceed functional analyses to where if you don't want to functionally analyze whether in vitro or in vivo um, hundreds of SNPs, you can proceed functional analyses by fine mapping your loci of interest just to narrow down the number of variants you're actually looking at. Um, there's numerous methods and even more packages for these methods. So we're going to be going over conditional fine mapping today using GCTA conditional and joint analysis and iterative modeling. Um, there's also Bayesian methods, including, including SUSY R and DAPG, and options to add functional annotations into uh, programs such as Paintor and Polyfine. Uh, so some considerations for fine mapping and picking tools is region size. Uh, you can use the log likelihood ratio of a um, SNP to determine how big your region that you should fine mapping should be. So log likelihood ratio is just the basic, um, I think it's something over P. And so it's just the likelihood that this SNP is the causal SNP, and you can pick within one to 1,000 likelihood um, your region size. That's one option. Uh, but you can also just, if you were to go back to the locus zoom plot, pick within the uh, areas of recombination, high recombination rates as well. Um, you also have to consider how complex your region is. If you've ever worked with the TERT region, it's uh, a monster. Um, I've also worked with the CDKM2A region, which is really close to the interferon genes, which is also very complex and messy. HLA, yeah. classic. Yeah. The HLA. So, Titan is um, the biggest gene as well. So definitely consider how big your how big your region can be and how big you might want to make it, depending on how complex it is. And then for specific loci, you might have a different prediction for the number of actual SNPs that are causal. So sometimes it's just one per loci, but sometimes there's multiple. Uh, I worked on a region before where we thought there were five causal SNPs over a single region. So for each tool, you would have a different capacity to how many causal SNPs the tool can actually look for and assess how many SNPs might actually be causal. I know Paintor is a tool that struggles to do any more than two. So consider that for sure. Um, and the other consideration is genetic ancestry and your reference data. Um, if you're using, depending especially on if you're working with a population that's not well represented, um, using reference data that represents that population rather than a reference data reference data set that doesn't um, because that is important for that linkage disequilibrium measure it's different between populations so we wouldn't want to use a reference data set with different linkage disequilibrium than the population we're actually looking at um, so that kind of brings me to the different input options for fine mapping Obviously, the gold standard is individual level genotype data. If you have individual level genotype data for your sample, you would be able to create an LD matrix from your individual level data and then also have those summary statistics. Um, well, you'd be able to make your own summary statistics, but we're not going to be doing that today with our individual level data because we only have 1,000 genomes. So we're going to be using summary statistics that are often publicly available and then a reference LD matrix. Now, we're using 1,000 genomes today, um, but the bigger reference LD matrix you can get, the better. So it's not highly recommended to use 1,000 genomes reference matrix at this point in time because there are larger matrices available. Um, and then you can also input just affected uh, estimated effect size and standard error along with the LD matrix sample size and then sum of squares of the outcome into fine mapping software as well. But for ease and simplicity, 
we're just going to focus on summary statistics and the reference LD matrix. Okay, so we're going to be working with GCTA conditional and joint association analysis, and I have the um, code linked or the website linked as well. Um, we're working with the summary statistics from which we only need the RSID, the minor and the minor allele, the frequency of the minor allele, the effect size, standard error, the p-value, and then we also need the n. So this is the one thing different from precise, which Emily's going to present on. And for picking a specific region for these GWAS summary statistics, as well as our LD matrix, we can use Plink to select out the region. So I have code here. So anyway, it's so using Plink, you just have to do the input file, and then you can pick a chromosome by indicating the CRH flag, and then you can select from a base pair to an end base pair if you would like, if you don't want to just analyze the whole chromosome. Um, and there's also an option in Plink to just extract a file of SNP IDs. So I think Emily showed you earlier just taking a single SNP out. You can do the same thing with a list of SNP IDs, just a single list. Like a text file? Yeah. Um, no column header, just Just a text file on each SNP. Yep. So um, in the scratch under, so the only tools you need to work with fine mapping are already loaded for you in a conda environment file, um, no, or titled snipassociations.yml. So to create your own environment that has all these tools, you would just need to copy this YML into your student directory, and then you can create this environment using this file and then activate that environment. Um, so for running GCTA, just basically you specify the function, specify where the Plink files are, um, specify your chromosome, what your minor allele frequency threshold is, and then you need that um, formatted Kojo file formatted in the way that was on the previous slide. Do you want to share screen and show things? Or do you want me to go somewhere with it? Um, we can go to the next slide and do it. Okay, so I have made some files for fine mapping in our workshop space. So I'll share my terminal screen. Okay, can you share? Thanks. We're working on two different computers. So Haley's gonna try and share her screen. Okay, to right. to zoom. Can't share. Posted and disabled screen sharing. I saw, Phil, can you... I saw, it, I saw it come back oh. as soon as I get it. Perfect. Okay. All right. So I'll change into... Can you make the text bigger? How? Uh, it's command plus. Command plus 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 yeah. Okay, so under find mapping in the SNP associations folder, there is two files. There is no, there is two files. Okay, so this Kojo format input format .r file is the R file for reformatting your summary statistics if you're not using the migraine summary statistics. So the only thing you need to edit in this file is the libpass and your personal file directory and any file name you want for the desired output. And this would format your file in the way that you need for GCTA Kojo. So it's really just a tiny burst command, like I'm going to use a fan of using where you select and rename the SNPs at the, or select and rename the columns at the same time. Um, and then we also have this 
findmapping.sh script. And this will run both of these scripts at the same time. So you would obviously need to edit all of this PDF stuff to reflect your personal settings, um, as well as the location of the Conda environment once you activate it. And then after running this R script to format that input, we then have the GCTA script with that B file input, which is our QC thousand genomes. Um, the chromosome that we selected, which for this migraine example is just chromosome 11, and then whatever minor allele frequency threshold you have, um, and your Kojo file formatted um, using this previous script. And then your out can just be whatever out prefix that you would want. And so what you'll get from this data is a output of independently related SNPs. Stop sharing. Okay. So from this output, you get sets of independently related SNPs. And one way I like to visualize these is as a positions plot. So you can just do this with a genome browser bed file, which is not the same as a pink bed file or as a plink bed file. So there's no headers, it's just the track name, description, um, chromosome number, position, position, RSID, arbitrary column, arbitrary column, position, position, and then RGB colors, um, you do have the option to have color tracks to make each of your different uh, independently related SNP sets different colors. And then as an output, you would kind of see something like this. So we just have where our SNPs are over the locus. And this might be helpful for um, future functional analyses or even just selecting from a low side, the SNPs most relevant and of interest. Any questions about fine mapping? It's a lot. You get it. This is an intro. <laughs> also, just a heads up that we can't see it very well. Um, we're only getting a partial view of the files you're showing on the screen. Oh. Right now? Now we can see it. This? Yeah. Yeah, I was purposefully doing it to the side because I was. Oh, okay. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. Were you able to see me showing my screen? Earlier, before you switched over to Emily? Yes. Yes. OK. Great. Yeah, I just got a notification that I got booted off of Sokka for some reason. So sorry. It happens. I was doing that while Haley was talking. <laughs> um, yeah, does anyone in the chat have any questions about fine mapping with anything that Haley just said? I'll give people a second to think while I'm logging in. If you have questions while I'm talking about my stuff, feel free to just like put stuff in the chat. Um, we are probably gonna finish like in the next half hour. Like this is the last section. It's not gonna be doing a full two hour thing, but yeah, if you're welcome to just hang around and ask questions afterwards. Um, so yeah. Um, the last thing is polygenic risk scores. So for things like migraines, um, heart disease, Alzheimer's, depression, like complex traits have many genes, many variants that contribute small effect to risk of a disease. And as mentioned in the morning session, a lot of someone's genetic risk interacts with their environment. So there is a lot of um, catastrophizing that happens in the media about like, oh, you're at a high genetic risk, you will develop the thing. That is not always true. Like take example BRCA with um, breast cancer. You have a higher risk of having breast cancer if you have the BRCA allele, but it is not deterministic. None of these things are deterministic. Um, some rare diseases are kind of deterministic, but for common complex diseases, for the most part, it's usually not. Um, there's always exceptions, but I'm speaking in broad strokes here. Um, so this is a great um, prototype. If you look here in this um, in this model, sorry, figure. Um, basically, you have a GWAS. I'll zoom in a bit. You have a GWAS, um, and you have your training sample. So the input data is called the base data, and then your individual level data is the target data. So for polygenic risk scores, you need both types. 
Um, so for the training sample, you need to have the outcome of interest. So for us, migraines, like does the person have a yes or no? And a lot of people do integrate age, sex, and ancestry into their um, model when you adjust for these things. Um, the genotype data, and again, non-genetic variables. Um, so it's demographic things like income and education are pretty common. And then clinical variables or lifestyle things like smoking are case dependent based on your study. Um, we talked about the pitfalls of regressing sex out as a covariate um, in the morning, but it is commonly done um, in these model fits. So when you're doing a polygenic risk score, you're trying to evaluate an individual levels, like a singular person's risk of disease using data from thousands of people as aggregated in GLOS on stats. So there's many different models and ways that people are trying to make these polygenic risk scores. Um, given the limitations of, for example, ancestry, a lot of GWAS some stats are done with people of primarily European genetic ancestry. So it's very, there's a lot of errors in applying these polygenic scores made on European sum stats to non-European populations. So these are models that are continuously being researched. And this model that we're gonna to cover today with Precise is an additive PRS model. Um, so basically, it's an equation, but it's quite straightforward. Um, polygenic scores are a single value, like a single value that is the sum of all SNPs to be included in your risk score. So the number of doses of that SNP that you have multiplied by the effect size. So the odds ratio or the beta value that we have in our sum stats. Um, so for example, for a three SNP PRS, someone might have zero copies of the effect allele and 0.5 would be the effect size for that one. Someone might have one copy of the effect allele, for example, a T, and then that multiplies by 1.3. And then you add it by this next SNP. Again, these are just kind of example values. Um, so this person might have be homozygous for the minor allele. Um, and if that has a 0.8 effect size, um, then it's added. So the important thing to note is that these SNPs include risks, um, variants that might be protective. So polygenic risk score is not just looking at SNPs that are negative. It also includes SNPs that are protective. And the summary statistics do capture those um, in the form of these beta or effect, like um, the beta or odds ratios. So that's just an important thing I want to clarify. Some people didn't know that when I was presenting about stuff before. Um, and how you choose which SNP to go into your polygenic score, I will explain next. So as I mentioned, there's a number of different softwares, but Precise 2 is um, a clumping and threshold model. It is the kind of baseline that a lot of people actually use to compare to other models. Um, if you go here, there is a website dedicated to the software that has a really helpful um, dictionary with regards to commands. And um, I did not go into all of these in my workshop, but you can see that there are lots of things you can play around with and include if you have the data for it. Um, and it is based, there is a GitHub, so you can download everything from the GitHub. Um, and there is an accompanying paper with it. Um, so if you wanna read a academic paper, um, it's really nicely spelled out here. Um, so those are resources you can check out after the workshop. Um, and please check out the PDF script under um, this precise subfolder. So me loving Cyberduck, here is Cyberduck. So that will be under um, precise, here we go. So you can see here that I have our target data, the QC 1000 genomes. I have this precise.r script, which was actually, this is written by the Choi and O'Reilly. Like this is something you do not edit. Um, precise underscore Linux is like, that's just the software environment. Like just, I have that there. I'd copy it into your local environment if you need it. And then um, the two things that are important. So we have a migraines um, clean some stats. That's a .txt file. And then um, a pheno file. So in my RMD precise underscore migraines, I kind of go into um, how I made a pheno file. Um, because I'm using simulated data, like this is a practice data set for the sake of this workshop, I like randomly assigned people the migraine phenotype, 
like zero one, you have it or you don't. It was a random thing, just because the one thousand genomes data doesn't come with migrate data. <laughs> um, but for your data, um, it's pretty straightforward. You just need to extract a file that has um, your ID and like a zero or one, like or if it's a quantitative trait, a quantitative trait, just like have the value in the next column next to the ID. That's what a pheno.txt file is. Um, and yeah, so I will navigate to my RMD and show you guys what that looks like. Um, so again, this is on the GitHub and um, also in the Scratch space. So you can just read it there. Um, so again, it's a PBS script output and um, you edit the wall time and your email and stuff up here. Um, you load the software environment here. And this is something that took me personally a long time to figure out what I wanted to do. So please know that this bit, the precise settings, is completely customizable to what you want to get out of your polygenic risk score analyses. Um, and I won't go over all these slides in depth right now. We can revisit them at the end if you want, or you can just look it up online on the precise website. Um, da -da -da -da. And yeah, you just submit these scripts and it's pretty straightforward. So I'll show you the output. Um, so when you submit a, a job with your individual level data with a target, um, your target data is your individual data from the base data GLOSS, you get a few things. First thing is quantile output. Um, so these two TXT files come out and you get this um, interesting table that basically breaks down the quantile, the odds ratio, the upper confidence interval, the lower confidence interval, um, a group to ignore that, and then the number of people in each group. So a polygenic risk score, as mentioned in this introduction thing back on slide 50, you're wanting to compare people who are at higher risk compared to lower risk. So one way that a lot of people do this is studying the top decile. So people who are in the top 90th decile, like between 90 and 100, if you have the highest scores, you're in the top 10% of highest scores of your population sample, you're at the highest relative risk um, of developing the trait. Again, this is relative risk, um, not absolute causative, you are going to get there. <laughs> um, and because this is simulated data, because migraines didn't come with a thousand genomes, this like smattering of lines and comments intervals looks kind of random, but in a true output, it would be having an upwards trajectory. Um, yeah. Okay. Just that one line I ended up having looking for a PBS script. Okay. Um, so the PBS script is just on the R markdown, not that's the PBS script. Okay. Okay. Um, I was just told that the PBS script is not there. That is okay. Um, I will upload it in like two seconds after I finish talking about all this. But it is in the RMD. So if you want to copy the stuff from the RMD into a PDF script, that's like what you can do right now. But I will copy that into a PDF script. Thank you for letting me know. Um, there was some shuffling around of files yesterday. Um, the second interesting output after quantiles that you get um, are p value thresholds. So Precise has a way of trying to help you optimize your own data set. So P-value thresholds are basically the way that Precise guides you into like, how many SNPs do you want to keep in your polygenic risk score equation? So the key thing from this output is like, if you look at this rightmost column, num SNP, you can see that it increases. Um, so the P-value threshold goes from 0 0.001, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.51. And you can see that as you go to the max level of P-value, um, different SNPs remain. So this is a visualization of that and the PRS model fit by an R squared value. Um, and yeah, um, you can use these outputs to determine how many SNPs you wanna keep in your model. Um, so remember back earlier, a few slides ago, I was like, oh, like how would you know how many SNPs you wanna have? This is kind of the way. You pick a p-value threshold and you include the SNPs um, under that threshold. Um, some people also just choose SNPs, which is a very biased way, but that's another way that people do it. And one thing that myself for my thesis, but also others for many of their works do, is that they want to compare 
how different summary statistics, different sources of summary statistics apply on the same population for a given trait. So for like heart disease or like depression or like an immune disorder, how do different studies, GWASs, predict or associate with a high polygenic risk score for that trait? You don't want to have different thresholds for each of those summary statistics. You want to compare those summary statistics at the same threshold. So there is a way to coerce um, precise into just using that mandatory threshold. So for example, just doing a P of under 0 0.01, like keeping SNPs that are under this P value. Um, you can use this no full flag with bar level 0 0.01 or whatever p-value, um, and it'll look at that threshold. And you can see here that um, it forces this output. You might be thinking, like, why should I care about having just one p-coercion when I have the values here? Well, the reason is that um, one of the outputs that's a key output of polygenic risk scores is getting this individual level polygenic risk score. So. Um, and this polygenic risk score will be based on the optimized p-value. So Precise will, get, will test all the p-values that you give it, and it will assign the polygenic score for the best fit model. Okay, so like, for example, if you want to test some stats number one, some stats number one might have p of 0 0.01 being like the best model, but then for your other some stats, it might be p of 0 0.05. And it would automatically output these individual level polygenic risk scores based on those optimized p-values. So if you want to coerce it so that it has the same p-value and you get a polygenic score for the same person but from different some stat inputs, um, this is the reason that you would do that. Um, and you can see that the PRS values are like e to the negative six. These are kind of arbitrary based on the some stats that you input. Um, what I recommend doing is scaling the scores around a z-mean of one before you integrate them into models like multivariable models um, as you would with any other continuous trait. Um, especially ones that might exhibit uh, non-normal distributions, but these are all normal distributions. So to see this as like an example in practice, I like literally did this for my thesis that I submitted two weeks ago. Um, if you want to like read it, it'll be on Circle in a couple of weeks. Um, but basically I used, I compared three different summary statistics files from the UK Biobank Neil Lab, um, and I compared a both sexes GWAS compared to a female stratified only GWAS um, compared to a male stratified only GWAS for depression. And I applied these polygenic scores on a target data called the CLSA, which is 16,000 people. And for obvious privacy reasons, I couldn't use the CLSA for this workshop because I don't have ethics for that. Um, and the point of this plot um, is to show that the different summary statistics perform differently on having association with odds of MDD. So MDD is depression, clinical depression. Um, and this is kind of weedy without giving you guys more context about my thesis, but the key takeaway is that as you increase in PRS decile, this overall trend increases. And the black asterisk is a significance relative to um, the reference, which is the lowest decile. And you can see here how there are sex differences in that the female specific um, GWAS performed better at associations with MDD in females compared to the green one, which is the data set where um, it was both sexes. Whereas with males, so for males with depression, um, the male specific GWAS did not actually perform the best. It was actually the both sexes GWAS that performed the best at predicting depression in males. So like that's an example of an application of both the decile analysis, but also um, I used a stringent p-value threshold of 0 0.01 so that I could compare these three input GWASs against each other. So if you want to like understand more of that, um, you can read my thesis. <laughs> How do you handle multiple testing when you start to go kind of you know, to summary statistics, which has already got its own burden of testing, and then you start to add things together? Like, where, how do you correct for that? So Phil's question was, how do I correct for multiple testing at the decile analysis level? Or uh, I guess I just, in the calculation of the PRS itself. Short answer is that you don't. So the clumping and thresholding chooses um, one SNP within, okay. 
backtrack. So clumping and thresholding. Okay. <laughs> so to account for multiple testing, that's first of all done in the GWAS substats. So people who are creating GWAS substats have to account for multiple questions before they post the summary statistics online. So there is some consideration before that. Um, the second thing is that clumping and thresholding. Thresholding is the p-value cutoff. What I didn't cover, so it's a great question, is the clumping. So precise is a clumping and thresholding method. Clumping is choosing the SNP that is the highest p-value. And among those in LD, in linkage disequilibrium, you remove, you do not include SNPs in your polygenic score that are within, that are over 0.1 correlated. And that's an example of a flag that you can change. So you can change which SNPs you exclude that are in LD, which would affect multiple testing. So if you decide to have a really low clumping threshold, you're introducing more type one error, I think. Like you're introducing more likelihood that you're including SNPs that aren't truly associated with the trait or just are confounding the the main one. Maybe um, if you reduced your clumping threshold because you're reducing the size, mm -hmm. then it would mm -hmm. have more chance of including more SNPs. That yeah, are like independent extraneous. SNPs. Because yeah. the larger your, clump holding, your clumping threshold is, the larger the region is that you're just picking one mm -hmm. SNP. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, for integration into multivariable models, which is what I did for my thesis, which is not in the slide deck, um, I adjusted for multiple correction with the PRS as its own value next to like 17 other covariates. So I did a corrected p-value of adjusting for those 17. So as a standalone, it's a pretty good value. I hope that answers the question. I hope people are not more confused. By did we, did we <laughs> restate what the question was? Well, it's just, I think there's so. a consideration of mm -hmm. I do. Uh, multiple testing correction. Yeah. Keeping track of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, so before we go into that last couple slides, we literally have two slides left. Is there anyone in the chat? Any outstanding questions? Okay. Um, so we're almost done. So. So, yeah, my computer died, so I'm going to oh, read off of yours. Oh, yeah. um, so I guess our biggest takeaway from this workshop, and if you take anything away from this, is just basics of troubleshooting this data, because um, we have run this type of data before, and so we figured we could offer you any suggestions. If you run into issues with our code or with any SNP analysis in the future, double check your alignments, both your... Um, reference build alignment, but also if your um, RSIDs don't match up or if they're not um, the same from the same database, you might have issues there. Um, you might also have issues with data types for columns. So that's something to make sure, especially if you're working with R, sometimes R can mess things up with that. And then the other thing is headers and then just overall data formatting in general. Sometimes files don't take comma delimited files or software don't take comma delimited files for some reason. So it's just double checking and making sure that your data formatting fits what the software is expecting. Um, yeah. So, and then on top of that, if you run into any other problems beyond this, make sure you check Google and Stack Overflow. Those are going to be your best friend for troubleshooting any of this in the future. And then beyond just the genome wide association studies, we have functional genomic applications for these different SNP association analyses. So with fine mapping, we have functional information. So any omics information that you have from any of your own personal studies or any other related studies to your trait can be um, used in concordance with these fine mapping softwares to inform that fine mapping material. I can't believe it. Oh, I'm just trying. Oh, great. Um, so, so to inform that fine mapping analysis that these variants might be more functionally related to your SNP. So that's what um, 
your omics data can contribute to fine mapping. But additionally, within polygenic risk scores, there is application for functional genomics and polygenic risk scores. Specifically, LDPRED Func is a new piece of software where you can incorporate any functional information to inform this polygenetic risk. Um, so if you guys want to attend the multi-omics workshops tomorrow and Monday the 8th, there is the potential to integrate polygenic risk scores and fine mapping with this multi-omics information. We love continuity. Um, so yeah, continuity. that is the end of our workshop. Yep, that's all we got. Uh, any questions? Just from... one, one comment for your slide 57. Just, I think when you're going through this, one of the things I think you guys did a good job with is because there are so many steps from beginning to end, when you're entering these things into like an R markdown, it's easy to figure out the steps that are taken. Whereas if you do a lot of this on the fly, it'd be impossible to track back mm -hmm. all the things that you had done. So I think that's a, and it's good practice. You have really nice R markdowns. So I think thinking about tracking all of these steps as you go if you don't have it explicitly run in chunks making notes about what you did with what parameters or what javascript because otherwise it's impossible to figure out yeah. at the end and mm -hmm. if you go to publish any of this they're going to ask you exactly what you did mm -hmm. to point them to mm -hmm. so, yeah i think um what phil was commenting on was having your code in an R markdown format and having it laid out as to what steps you completed at what points so that if you do at any point have to go back and troubleshoot anything that we mentioned, you have that code that you use to get to that answer um, on hand. So especially with running GCTA, like we have the basic code to run GCTA, but if you ever run it with different parameters or different thresholds, make sure that you have that written down somewhere so that you can always reference back to that when you have to validate those choices and mm -hmm. potentially revise those choices mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Guys.